Hi, everyone. It's Luke Johnson. It's been a little while. I am from uh, Noetic.online, the humanities social media platform where you can build relationships with people over great ideas, great thinkers, and great authors. And we're going to be talking about a great author today with another great author. We'll be talking about Thomas Hardy's Far From Mad and Crowd with Dr. Jonathan Cook. And um, just moments ago, Dr. Jonathan Cook told me he had a very personal relationship with this book. And uh, I think it'd be good if you enlightened our audience about your connection to this text. Yeah. Okay. So um, I did, I've done an edition of the book for Barnes and Noble. Um, it's called. It's in the Barnes and Noble Classic series, and um, it uh, you know it dates from 2005. Here's the cover of it, um, and I did the introduction and notes and some of the. Uh, critical materials at the end and the uh, author note so um, it's a good uh, introduction to the book and uh, synthesizes a fair amount of scholarship relating to the book and then adds some some of my own ideas about it um, but uh, it's one of about three or four uh, annotated editions that you can get today um, so uh, so we are talking to an we're talking to an authority <laughs> with a capital A on the yeah, text. Yeah, well I I've actually visited uh uh you know Hardy Country in uh Dorset. So uh I can share some of my experiences of seeing the house where he was born and where he wrote the book and uh you know the town of Dorchester, the city of Dorchester and uh, some of the landscape around there, which is really kind of magical. Uh, and you, you find that in the book uh, descriptions as well. I'm, I'm really excited to have you do an exegesis of this text. Um, it's, been a, it's been a few weeks since I completed the text, and I've been doing so many other things. I, I mentioned this earlier. I just wanted to offer a general impression. Um, I found this to be... If I, if I can recollect correctly, this is one of the most beautiful books that I believe that we, we have covered, but um, at least during my first reading of it, or I, I want, I, I struggled a little bit more to find the, the philosophical richness. And I kind of was hoping that today you would sort of uh, explicate a lot of that. Um, I actually, and I actually was able to watch um a version of the movie. <laughs> Have you seen any of the versions yeah, of the movie? Yeah, well, um, which one did you see? Because my, my favorite is I, still the Julie Christie, 1967, Alan Bates. Uh, John Schlesinger was the director. But they've also, they also did a 1998 BBC series. And then there's a, a, a more recent one with a woman named Carrie Mulligan, who's an American actress. Yes, that's the one I saw. Love, but that's the one I saw. She left out huge chunks of the book. And... Uh, yeah. I found it really kind of the least uh, satisfying of every, all of them, and I, I was kind of shocked by how much material they left out of the story. Um, well, they only had two hours to do yeah. it, you know. I, I, who knows what editorial reasons they chose. I, you know, I thought it was okay, but uh, I'm I'm just lo really looking forward to you uh, sort of bringing in the the uh, the the intellectual strength of the text. So, where would you like to begin? Well, uh, <laughs> let's just there's so much to talk about. Start how... with uh, you know how it got written and where it fits into Hardy's career, and um, I mean in general, you know Hardy's a great uh, teller of stories. You know he just he's a masterful designer of plots, and uh, that's you know it's a real gift to be able to do that, and he. Uh, you know, the story, it, it's not a Moby Dick or something with this huge philosophical uh, burden to it, but it's certainly uh, a brilliant a story about the, the pleasures and, and terrors of, of, of Eros and uh, human relationships and human psychology um, and uh, rural life as well, you know, descriptions of, of what it's like to live on a farm and face all the uh, problems that you can face, you know, taking care of all your animals and crops and whatnot. So uh, um, 
you know, Hardy's great theme was romantic love and sexual love. Uh, so it's really one of a, a variation on all the many books he wrote on that subject. Um, so anyway, he he conceived in a late uh, 1872 um, when he had uh, he was just finishing a beautiful book called A Pair of Blue Eyes, which was um, um, really a novel about his meeting the woman that he married, um, Emma Gifford, you know, whom he met. Uh, in 1870, when he went up to a town called St. Juliot, Juliet's in Cornwall, kind of north uh, west of where he lived in, in Dorset. And uh, he was helping to renovate an old church, because that's what he did as an architect, as a professional architect. Um, and uh, the, the sister of the uh, rector's uh, wife, uh, was the uh, was Emma Gifford who was living there, and he met her, and they talked, and they got along pretty well. She had sort of literary ambitions, and um, so Hardy wrote a book, a *Pair of Blue Eyes*, which was about his courtship of Emma, and then um, *Far from the Madding Crowd* sort of uses Emma a little bit in the character of Bathsheba. Um, certain aspects of her character. And it was on the strength of the success of that book that he felt able to marry her in uh, 1874 when the book was published, even though her father uh, didn't like Hardy, didn't like the fact that he came from a working-class background. You know, Hardy's father was a mason and a, and a builder, and uh, Hardy's family was distinctly uh, below the Giffords uh, in their in their social status. Uh, so that kind of feeds into Gabriel Oak, you know, as this working man who um, starts out as a shepherd and uh, try to goes, goes into business with his uh, sheep farming and then loses a lot of them through accidents and rises up to finally marry. Bathsheba, who's the owner or the proprietor of this um, extensive farm uh, that she's inherited, so that you know the uh, the story of his courtship and projected marriage shows up in the book because when it was published, he hadn't actually quite married her. Um, I, I, I'm so curious, and I, I want I, I'm I, I wonder if you're going to address this later, but it's I believe it it sticks out in the book a little bit that. Bathsheba has no idea where she got her name, right? But it's a it's a biblical yeah. name. It and if if memory serves me correctly, Bathsheba was the was one of the was well, a mistress it, of David. One of the women, yeah, I mean David fell in yeah. love with her, looking at her nude bathing on the rooftops of Jerusalem, and then he you know he went over and said, "Who is that woman?" He found out who she was. Found out she was married to uh, Uriah, a, a Hebrew general, and made sure that Uriah went into the front of his troops to be killed in battle, so it would free up you know, Bathsheba to, uh, to marry him. And uh, So he was an adulterer you know, before that happened. And um, you know, as a punishment, his first child with Bathsheba died. Uh, but his second son, of course, was Solomon, who you know, went on to rule after David. Well, it makes me curious who, who are David and Solomon in our story. <laughs> I mean, that's a very purposeful choice. And then also you mentioned that, um, uh, you mentioned that, that, uh, the response to Masonry may be something that sets the stage for this novel. And if that inspired this, this choice of name as well. Well, the, uh, you know, the figure, who um, is kind of involved with Bathsheba in the novel, of course, is Troy, who's a military man like David was. But, of course, David was a, a you know Hebrew national hero, whereas Troy was a kind of a scapegrace um, cavalry sergeant. But uh, one of the parallels you find, though, is when um, Bathsheba in the in the novel is potentially uh, getting involved with Troy after they've met on that dark night, you know, with his spur getting caught in her 
the the edge of her dress. Um, uh, Gabriel, you know, kind of lectures about lectures her about how, you know, she should do the honorable thing and pay more attention to Boldwood than Troy, and that Troy was not really uh, worth her attention, which puts Gabriel in the role of Nathan the prophet, you know, who is the, the Hebrew prophet who tried to intervene with David and tell him that he was committing adultery, you know, that he he should back off from that. Um, so there, you know, there's some rough parallels there. It's not, you know perfect well it's a very charged name it's a very charged yeah. name but um you know her father uh we don't know much about her parents except the description of her father who was um kind of an odd he was a tailor uh who uh you know made a fair amount of money but he apparently um um was not really uh, happy with being married, and, you know, he didn't like to be tied down. So when he actually did marry a woman, uh, you know, his her mother, he li didn't like her to wear a ring, and he li pretended that, you know, they had just met. So the father, the father's sort of capricious nature has obviously been inherited by uh, Bathsheba, who, you know, obviously grew up yeah, as a as a teenager without parents, uh, and that's a little bit why she's so willful because she she never had, you know, parental supervision so to speak, and that's why she makes some disastrous choices because she, you know, she wants to get whatever she has a mind to. You know, she's very determined to, when she does things um, in her personal life. So anyway, so that's. One interesting biblical connection, but no, another one, of course, is the figure of Eve. You know, her name is Bathsheba Everdeen, so Ever Eve or Edeen. You know, so you have the words Eve and Eden in her last name, and she definitely has inherited the um, um, aspects of the biblical Eve, who. Um, was uh, in Milton's, at least in Milton's Paradise Lost, enamored of her own image. You know, in uh, the Eden of Milton, there's a lake in Eden where she looks in, in the water and admires her image. And the reason that she's seduced by the serpent is that he tells her how beautiful she is. Uh, you know, this is not in the Old Testament. This is Milton's elaboration. So, in fact... Um, Hardy was reading Paradise Lost when he when he wrote the book, so uh, you find some interesting parallels between. Uh, which wouldn't be which wouldn't be a wrong inference to make. I mean, there's a lot of controversy about those early passages in Genesis about what it meant for the serpent to beguile yeah. Eve. That word beguile yeah. is quite a loaded. Yeah, I'm actually word. I'm actually reading a really interesting book now of Bruce Filer. Uh, about the the e the Ab Adam and Eve story as a love story, it's quite it's quite a a good you know popular overview between between Adam and Eve or yeah. Eve and the serpent. Well, Adam and Eve, uh, he uh, he's he's <laughs> he's arguing that you know this was the first great love story as a model. Uh, you know, romantic love didn't begin with medieval courtly love or classical love it really began in the hebrew bible in the in the uh in the genesis story and uh i i'd recommend it you probably like it it's came out last year um you know bruce filer he's written um about half a dozen books about um the bible in connection with the modern world the hebrew bible mainly so anyway eve and um uh, and Bathsheba, uh, you know, she's first image of her in the novel is of her admiring herself in the mirror as she is sitting on the wagon um, that where, where Gabriel sees her when she's going to live with her aunts on the farm next to where Gabriel has uh, his sheep pastured. And the first comment that Gabriel makes on her is vanity, as though it's going to be her downfall, that she's too vain of her beauty, you know. So, uh, 
that's why she succumbs to Frank Troy is because he's very adept at telling her she, how she, beautiful as she is, and she just can't resist the appeal of his flattery. And so he's kind of like the serpent in, in Eden. And, uh, he, you know, he has some other devilish qualities besides the that particular scene. Um, and uh, the other uh, biblical context for the book is uh, Gabriel's name, of course. You know, the angel Gabriel in the Old Testament. Gabriel is, uh, in the book of Daniel, he, he kind of... Uh, Gabriel informs Daniel about all these prophetic uh, events that are going to happen, and then in the New Testament, Daniel is—I'm sorry—Gabriel is the the uh, makes the annunciation to Mary that she's pregnant. Um, so in the Old Testament, he's kind of a guardian of of the world, you know, one of the archangels, and then the New Testament, he's has a connection with Eve. Um, I'm sorry, with Mary as the uh, you know, as the second Eve who is pregnant with Jesus. And it's funny because um, two places in the book you see that being relevant because when Gabriel originally proposes to Bathsheba, one of the things he mentions to her is how wonderful it will be when they announce the babies being born in the newspaper. Uh, and she's listening to him describe, you know, what she'll be able to enjoy as his spouse, and that's one of the prominent things, uh, kind of like Gabriel in the, in the New Testament um, as, the, as the agent of Annunciation. The other scene, of course, is when Fanny Robbins' body is being brought back to um, the estate, Bathsheba's farm, and um, on the top of the coffin it's written, Fanny Robin and Child, in chalk, where right. uh, you know when they took the wagon out from the uh, the union, the poorhouse, and 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 shipped her body back to uh, or put her body uh, you know back to uh, be buried in the cemetery, and um, uh, you know it's brought back to the house because it's too late to do the burial, and they're going to keep the body in the coffin overnight. Bathsheba, you know, says, "We're, you know, just keep it here. We'll bury her in the morning." And then, when Gabriel sees, when because he brought the coffin in the wagon back to the house, when he sees on the lid Fanny Robin and child, he he uh, rubs out and child, uh, so right, she doesn't hurt her. know that this is Troy's child with his with his former, um, you know, jilted lover. So there, it's not an annunciation <laughs> that he's making as an angel of the Lord. You know, it's like a, it's like an elimination of of an announcement to the world that a child has been born. So I think Hardy was very clever to do that little reversal of of the biblical symbolism, uh, which of course he knew the Bible very well. He, you know, one of his early ambitions was to be a, an Anglican priest at one point because he, he loved the services and loved the music of the Anglican church. What do you think he was trying to communicate um, with with Gabriel and the mishaps with his sheep? Because sheep are obviously, you know, very symbolic. Yeah, well, uh, you know, he is uh, he's the good the shepherd, Bible. right? So he's always has the interest of his flock, uh, and he's very upset by the, by the idea that he actually will sell these, the lambs to be slaughtered. Uh, you know, he's raising these sheep, and that's a, you know, he doesn't like that idea, even though that's how you make money with sheep, either with wool or with lambs. Um, so, but that, I mean, that's just... Because um, there are a couple of dramatic episodes yeah, with the sheep. Yeah, yeah. The sheep uh, have a sort of symbolic role um, as, um, you know, based on the imagery of the good shepherd and, the, you know, particularly when the sheep go into the pasture and get uh, bloated with, uh, you know, they go into the, the clover field and they, they are eating uh, so that they're going to be pumped with gas and that will kill them because I guess it, you know, clogs up their digestive system and then um uh Gabriel has just been dismissed from Bathsheba's farm because he 
had the presumption to offer her advice about her love life, you know, and then she has to beg him to come back because he's the only one who knows how to use this little sliding tube that you use to puncture their their belly to let the air out, you know. And in the book, it's called the instrument of salvation, uh, a little phrase which is kind of like, you know, he comes with his cross. Uh, it's not a cross, but it's a little tube that lets the air out, the spirit, you know, coming through the tube. Uh, so it's a little play on the uh, symbolism as Gabriel as a sort of secular saint uh, and a Christ figure who is, you know, taking care of her sheep for her and bringing them new life. Um, um, but I think in the beginning of the book, when his sheep were killed by his dog, um, chasing them, uh, you know, forcing them to go over this cliff, there's a distinct symbolism there of the fall. This is kind of Gabriel's fall from from grace because he's an independent, you know, farmer in the beginning and now he has to go and war earn his livelihood through the sweat of his brow, you know, and the sheep have all died. So it's it's sort of his initiation into struggles in the world, um, just in, you know, in the fourth chapter of the book. So the book really begins sort of yeah. after the fall of Gabriel and uh, before her fall. Her fall comes along with Troy. Yeah. There's a um, passage when the dog chases the sheep off the cliff. And this was, it was probably my favorite passage. <laughs> I'm trying to get it from memory. Well, yeah. I, but I, I think you know the yeah, one I'm, George's I'm re son, making reference to. He ate some, you know, sheep meat. Normally, Gabriel, the dead, the dead lambs, you know, he doesn't feed them to the dogs because it makes him kind of crazy to have raw meat. But the dog ate this meat and then got a little bit too uh, excited and willful. And then, uh, uh, you know, he chased the sheep off. And then there's a great image of him with his standing on the edge of the cliff with his face and profile like Napoleon on um, uh, St. Helena, you know, St. Uh, Helens, uh, which is a famous scene of Napoleon, you know, uh, in his in his uh, captivity there, looking proud and defiant, having killed, you know, millions of people in the European wars, uh, compared to the dog who's just killed several, uh, maybe, what, a hundred sheep or something like that. Um, so it's a kind of funny analogy between Napoleon and the dog. Well, I like the passage. Uh, I'll just read it real quick. George's son had done his work so thoroughly that he was considered too good a workman to live and was, in fact, taken and tragically shot at 12 o'clock that same day. Another instance of the untoward fate which so often attends dogs and <laughs> other philosophers who follow out a train of reasoning to its logical conclusion and attempt perfectly consistent conduct in a world made up so largely of compromise. Yeah. And, and uh, I'll just have to say that as a philosopher... And as a philosopher who has uh, followed the line of reasoning to very unpopular conclusions, uh, that that out out of the entire book, that that paragraph resonated with me the yeah. most. I I don't know about is that is that a particularly famous no, passage? No, you, or, I, but it just shows that there's a sort of wonderful humor in this book uh, that you don't find in some of Hardy's later novels. You know, because there's there's a there's a sort of joyful uh, embrace of life and its contradictions that you find in the book, and, and lots of humorous descriptions of characters, and particularly the farm workers, you know, some of them are pretty amusing, and, and their uh, speech habits and, and uh, foibles, you know, which is, you don't really find in, in Jude the Obscure, Tess of the Durbervilles. I mean, Hardy at that point was pretty grim philosopher of life, but... Um, yeah, so he has a deft uh, way of describing things like that. Uh, but, you know, he grew up in rural England, and he, you know, he was surrounded by dogs and sheep and uh, farmers and all that. So he, he knew it, you know, from a childhood. That was something that's interesting to me. when I, About a month ago, when I was doing some research on Thomas Hardy and making these educational materials for Noetic, uh, the, the, the scholars in the public domain materials from early in the 
20th century were saying, well, this was starting to hint at uh, Hardy's uh, nihilism or his, or his sadness or something like that. And I think you just alluded to it as yeah. well. Um, I guess I'm just kind of curious if you could elaborate upon that and where this book sort of fits in with, with his, uh, his corpus. Yeah. Well, you know, he, he, he already read Darwin pretty much right as, as soon as it came out, you know, in 1859, 1860. And he, I mean, he was full-blown Darwinian uh, right from the get-go. So he, he became a sort of pessimistic evolutionist who, who really understood what Darwin was getting at. And, uh, you know, the editor of the magazine where the book was published, Leslie Stephen, you know, Virginia Woolf's father, uh, Leslie Stephen is a famous, um, uh, you know, agnostic, intellectual, and literary man. And uh, so it's appropriate that, that the book was sort of... Um, incubated by his relationship with this guy Leslie Stephen because you do find a kind of amoral image of nature in in the book in the description of uh, you know this the the death of the sheep just you know this is what happens uh, nature is creative and destructive you know the storm scene during the harvest supper um, you know, the threat to uh, all the work that the farm people have done. One particular image is of the uh, when Bathsheba uh, decides that she can't be with her husband anymore. She goes out and spends the night outside next to a swamp. And the description of that swamp is sort of an image of nature as a sort of um, amoral realm of grotesque, uh, creatures and uh, uh, life and death uh, happening uh, without any kind of, you know, divine intervention one way or the other. So, um, you know, you see a positive, in general, you see, you see a positive image of rural life because Hardy is really working in the pastoral tradition here. You know, he's consciously writing a book that uses a lot of the pastoral symbolism and motifs that date back to ancient Greece. You know, Theocritus uh, wrote, uh, you know, the first pastoral poetry as a displaced Sicilian living in Alexandria, Egypt. You know, he had nostalgia for his, his native Sicily and wrote these poems celebrating shepherds and love and the, you know, simplicity and harmony of rural life. And then, uh, you know, the whole tradition was picked up by uh, Roman poets and then in English poetry by Edmund Spencer and Milton and a whole raft of poets um, that influenced uh, some of the um, later writers. I mean, George Eliot's Adam Bede is another pastoral novel that, you know, her influence came from Wordsworth as a pastoral writer. And so I think the immediate inspiration for Hardy was Adam Bede, uh, published in uh, like 1860, I think, um, uh, you know, a little more than a decade before he was writing. So he's he's definitely, you know, working this pastoral mode with descriptions of musical contests and singing and flute playing by Gabriel as a as a uh, as a shepherd and uh, describing the loves sometimes the unrequited loves of shepherds and shepherdesses, which is what you find in Theocritus's poetry, you know. Um, so it's a very old tradition he's working, uh, as, as it was updated by George Eliot as his immediate forebear. Um, I have to dig into some the you're you're inspiring me to dig into Theocritus. <laughs> well, I, I wrote, don't know. Well, you know, they they're they're uh I think there's 16 poems and they have various topics of, about um uh shepherds discussing their love interests and more, you know, one is a pastoral elegy of a, a wonderful shepherd who died and others are song contests who can sing the best song and play the best, best flute, some things like that. Um, and, of course, Virgil wrote the Eclogues, which are pastoral poems. Um, 
So, uh, but then, you know, in English literature, you have a ton of writers who were, you know, working in the, in the genre in the 16th and 17th century and 18th century as well. No, you always give me homework. I always <laughs> appreciate that about our, our dynamic. Yeah. I always have to go back and research things. But, I mean, in terms so, of philosophy, I mean, Hardy was an agnostic. He, he fully embraced Darwin. He lost his faith. And, uh, you know, he... How did, how did he so easily embrace Darwin? I mean, not, not that... I, you know, I try to put myself in the mind of, of people that are hearing new scientific paradigms for the first time. It's not easy. It's not. It's easy for someone like yeah. us, uh, because we have, you know, well, many generations of of Darwinists espousing the view. But when a new view comes along, it's not yeah. it's not easily accepted. A lot of people forget that, you know, when Copernicus first came around, people were like, "Yeah, you don't make any sense." And like when Newton was propounding gravity, people were like, "That's absurd." Yeah. Why did um well why did Hardy take to Darwin so quickly? Well, I mean, he was Darwin was a respected naturalist. I mean, he had made his name uh, from his book on the Voyage of the Beagle. So, uh, you know, natural history was a big topic for for the general public to be reading. So, you know, people knew Darwin as one of the wonderful, you know, great natural history writers of the mid Victorian era. And uh, I think uh, Hardy was lucky in that he had a mentor, a guy named Horace Mull, uh, or Horace Mull, um, M-O-U-L-E, who was uh, part of a local family of uh, Anglican ministers. He was one of many children of the local Anglican preacher, priest in, in um, Dorchester. And Horace Mool was, I think, about eight years older than Hardy, and he was you know, he he had been educated. Um, I forget if it was Oxford or I think it was Oxford, and uh, so he shared books with Hardy and sort of fed him in the latest uh, important books coming out, and uh, you know they would talk about them. And uh, Horace Mool studied. Uh, he wrote a textbook on Roman history. He was kind of a uh, he wasn't a you know minister, but he was very well versed in in uh, religious subjects, <clears throat> and uh, he died tragically a suicide in September 1873, um, when Hardy was writing the book. And I argue that he's sort of the partial model for for Boldwood, um, as as sort of a manic, um, depressive type character. Um, and uh, Horace Mool killed himself. He slit his throat, and it was sh it was shocking for Hardy. He he really carried that uh, you know the 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 real um, you know sadness of that event throughout his life because this guy was you know really important to him as a, as a young man as his as his mentor in a way that his you know no one else in his family could be. That's traumatizing. Yeah. That's so he had, wow. you know, his pessimism was fed by, you know, what he saw around him, the, 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 you know, death, you know, he had a cousin's relatives who died young, he had this guy committed suicide, um, you know, Victorian England still had a pretty high mortality rate, you know, just before <clears throat> the germ theory of disease was, was, you know, promulgated, this was you know, 1850s and 60s. Um, so, uh, he, uh, I mean, it was a part, it was really going on throughout the Victorian world with a lot of intellectuals of that era, like uh, Leslie Stephen, who famously lost his faith and resigned his, um, his, his career uh, at Cambridge because he couldn't, subscribe to the, uh, you know, 39 articles. He had to sort of forswear an academic career. That's why he became a, a man of letters, because he couldn't uphold the religious tests that you still had to pass at uh, in a lot of, you know, English schools. It was kind of hard to believe that, you know, to be able to teach, you had to, you know, sign on as a very devout Christian. 
Well, one would argue that there are different religious texts now, tests now, but uh, <laughs> that would be that's a that's an alternate conversation. Yeah. But pendulum tends to swing. Um. So we haven't even we've tap we've tap danced around this or haven't. Uh, where did the title come from? Yeah, Far From the Mountain Crowd is uh, from Gray's Elegy in a Country Churchyard. It's a famous poem of the 18th century that uh, laments the the fact that these rural people and this cemetery that he is uh, evoking um, never had a chance to blossom because they lived in a, a sort of... Um, um, a world that was away from major cities and major ideas. So it's a sort of uh, far from the crowd just means, you know, far away from busy crowds, which mainly meant London. You know, this is pastoral, uh, you know, rural England that he's describing. So this poem was very, very well known at the time. And he just took a line from it to describe the fact that he's writing about country people because you know, to be a popular novelist, I mean, Party's career depended on being able to uh, sell books. And uh, to be a popular artist, you have to cater to the tastes of the populace. And, you know, to do that, you have to uh, make sure that your urban readers are happy. Because a lot of books are about, you know, people living in London or thereabouts. I mean, look at Dickens or Thackeray or Wilkie Collins. Uh, so he's intentionally writing about rural England, away from cities. And so he points that out in, in his title as a way to you know, draw attention to it, to make sure people know that's what his topic is. But, you know, so it ties in with the pastoral theme. You know, he's making sure that people know he's talking about the rural landscape, not the cities where a lot of other writers were, were locating their work. You mentioned earlier that you'd been to Dorset yeah. and how that had inspired a, a fair amount of what uh, the settings yeah. that occur in this text. Could you uh, share some of those experiences and how they inform your understanding of the text? Yeah, well, it's just, it's, it's just such a beautiful countryside. It's still pretty much agricultural there you know it's about three hours south west of London um, and um, uh, the the town you know the market town is Dorchester which still kind of looks like a 19th century you know small city town whatever and Hardy was born in a little hamlet outside of, the, of that called uh, higher Bockhamton and um, you can visit his birthplace. It's a house that his father built, and uh, it's got a thatched roof in it, um, and it's got a little garden. It's right next to some some uh, extensive woods. And uh, the countryside around there is kind of rolling hills, and you know these huge, sort of humped hills that you see described in the first chapter of the book when he's, you know, first couple of chapters when he's describing the landscape there, which is, what, about 10 miles north of the English Channel. So uh, you, you just, uh, you know, it's this great sort of ancestral England where you have Roman uh, remains in the area, you know, um, the Romans had a fort in Dorchester, you know, Chester in English towns mean, comes from the Latin word castrum, which means camp, you know, so it was a Roman encampment. And, uh, so occasionally you can dig up Roman coins and find burial spots. So you, you really have this very, uh, amazing connection with the, with the deep, with deep history, um, and uh, so um, the landscape, you know, fortunately, is you really, you really can experience it yourself if you want to and go visit the town. And you can also visit his house, Max Gate, which is where he lived when he, when he was, after he came back to the area in the 1880s. 
um, because you know he went to live in London for a while with his with his wife. Uh, but he when he wrote this book, uh, he was living at home with his parents in Higher Bockington in this thatched cottage, and then uh, you know going out and taking walks and getting ideas, coming back and writing. Uh, how old, a, how old a man was he when he wrote this? Um, so he was in his early 30s. So he would have been 33, uh, 33, 34. And, um, you know, this was... Well, what do you, what do you think about this? I'm, you know, I'm not too far from that age. I'm, I'm 38 years old. Uh, but I think about, you know, still when you're 33 years old, the uh, the uh, the idea of uh, of romantic love can pull you in many different directions, and that's that's primarily what this book is about, right? Yeah. Is is all these? Uh, yeah. That that she would can't decide. Well, sh- should I be with him? Should I be with him? Should I be with him? Did you? I mean, do you? I guess what I'm trying to ask here is that kind of a reflection of a, 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 a man obsessed with, with love or, or is there something deeper to that? I mean, are we, are we kind of getting well an, an aperture into the soap opera of a young man? I think it's a little of both because he was very susceptible. I mean, Hardy, uh, you know, he had a little uh, crush on his cousin when he was a teenager and then, you know, when he was younger... Um, he kind of took a shine to the woman who helped him get an education, uh, paid for his education, um, uh, a local uh, wealthy woman whose estate might have served as the model for Bathsheba's farm. And then when he was actually uh, thinking about marrying Emma, he met a woman who um, was, I think, an illustrator who lived in London and kind of took a shine to her. And then I think, um, you know, he decided to marry Emma, and then, of course, they ended up kind of being estranged after a few years of marriage, partly because they couldn't have any kids. Um, so his personal life, so he, what, he, so what you're he was say, susceptible so what you're saying to is romantic that... love, but then he saw that this was the big topic of novels anyway. I mean, look at Jane Austen. or uh, Right. You know, the novel itself exists to describe, you know, the trials and traumas of romantic love, you know, starting with Fielding and and Richardson. Uh, Well, yeah, that's I guess that's kind of the question I have for you here, because that, you know, this is something I'm not a I'm not a a trained literature scholar, (laughs) which I guess everybody knows. But, you know, it's sort of surprising to me to think about the novel is this living, breathing, evolving sort of entity, and it me- meaning different things at different times. Yeah. And, um, well, like sometimes I think to myself, oh, if I were to write a novel, uh, what I would do is that I would use the novel to cloak this deep philosophical doctrine that I can't dare explicate in a straightforward way because it would horrify people and they're not ready for yeah. it. Um, but I don't get the sense that's what. <laughs> Hardy intends to do well, with the novel or what a lot of people were doing with the novel at that time. Well, I think it was important that he convey his his philosophy of um, uh, you know, this sort of post-Darwinian agnosticism. I mean, he read a German philosopher named Edward Hartmann who was sort of a disciple of Schopenhauer. I think he read Schopenhauer, but Hartmann was sort of the... Uh, a follower of Schopenhauer in the development of this sort of uh, will, um, uh, you know, his his sense of, of life being the sort of irrational clashes of willpower and uh, the need to sort of step outside of that realm, which is what Schopenhauer was, was promoting. Um, so, you know, he read, he was, he was pretty well read in contemporary philosophy. Um, I don't, think he was a big, uh, uh, you know, of Kantian or Hegelian, but definitely later 19th century. He read Comte, August Comte, and Hartmann, yeah, 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 yeah. and Darwin, and uh, he, um, 
you know, some of his friends were some of the leading uh, psychologists and psychological researchers of the later 19th century. Um, but then again, you know, his big topic was relationships and, and, and romantic love. And uh, uh, it's partly because the novel, you know, traditionally has been read by women. You know, the big audiences for the first fiction in the 18th century were, you know, domestic uh, women who uh, had the time to read uh, Richardson, you know, a thousand pages of uh, Clarissa, you know. Uh, or, or um, so, um, you know, Hardy is working in the mainstream of British fiction, uh, kind of in the follower of George Eliot, um, but he, you know, he loved Dickens, he read Dickens and Trollope and uh, um, Thackeray, so, uh, you know, he was pretty much immersed in, in, the, in the world of Victorian fiction. He went to hear Dickens read when he lived in London. No oh, cool. Um, what do you think he teaches? What do you think he teaches us about romantic love? <laughs> That's a I big question, he, isn't it? It's, I it's, think it's he, on our uh, list. <laughs> I think he sees, you know, the sex impulse as a sort of neutral uh, force that can, you know, destroy you if you're not careful. Or it can, you know, create a happy life. But it's, I think most of his later fiction is about how, uh, you know, love is just a, a minefield, you know. <laughs> and if you make it through it, you're lucky without getting blown up at some point. Um, you know, like the Mayor of Casterbridge or Jude the Obscure or Tessa the Durbervilles. I mean, all of these are tragic stories. Uh, about, you know, unfulfilled or catastrophic relationships. And um, so I think he, you know, he accurately read the the world around him. Uh, he wasn't glamorizing anything. He was, you know, he was, if anything, he was too frank. And that's why people turned against him with Tess of the D'Urbervilles. And, and, you know, he eventually gave up writing fiction because he was so fed up with his readers complaining, you know, about how immoral he was when he was just describing the life that really existed around people. Well, now I'll say this. There was one particular scene that has not, a, I don't, has not occurred in my life, but there, there's a scene with the, uh, with Troy and the yeah. sword play in the forest yeah. with Bathsheba. No, that's no. a little bit of foreplay. What do you, you know, a Victorian <laughs> with a sword. That, I mean, that's... He pin, man, the last that's, gesture is he pins this little worm on her front of her dress that's like, uh, you know, getting her maiden head. <laughs> but no, Hardy this, had that, an that, uncle... That's a really intense scene. It is. It's a beautiful scene. Hardy had an uncle who was uh, trained as a swordsman, so he'd seen him uh, displaying his his expertise. I think it was with a broadsword, but <clears throat> it's obviously, uh, you know... The, the the scene where she's pretty much seduced by his masculine uh, prowess, you know, with his sword. But it's like he could, but she like falls in love with him because she, well, uh, it's right. She is seduced, but like the seduction happens during an event where he could have easily taken her yeah. life. And what does that say about the nature of seduction? Yeah. That, you you could fall in love with someone when they could be a hair's breadth within yeah. killing you. Yeah. I mean, I think it's pretty profound. Yeah. And in the end, he's the one who's killed uh, as, that, a, as that, the, you know, ex the military guy. Well, this is interesting because he has a couple deaths, <laughs> right? right. He's, a, he's yeah. a death hoax. He's a death hoax. That's hoaxer. right. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that was a wonderful scene. I love the scene when he comes back and he's, you know, he's uh, in the circus act as a famous uh, scoundrel, criminal, uh, you know, rogue, uh, doing the equestrian act at the at the sh the fair. Um, so, so you min I think you mentioned something about the 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 novel's reception that it wasn't uh, universally well, met with fanfare. What was the reception like? It it sold well, and that's was the most important thing for Hardy because then he could make start making a living as a writer because he had been an architect almost up to that point taking work um, and uh, 
So now he knew he could make a living, but the the press was mixed. Some of the critics thought it was great, and other people thought it... Uh, well, Henry James famously said the, the most interesting things about it were the dogs and the sheep. Uh, so he was put off... He was put off. <laughs> what a backhanded! <laughs> what, what a backhanded! Well, you know, compliment. he's a novelist of manners. He he wants people. He wants drawing rooms. He wants conversation and and class issues. You know, so he he was totally looking for the wrong thing. I mean, it just shows his bias as a writer. Uh, and he may have known that it was a brilliant book, but he you know he was jealous of him or just didn't want to uh, give him credit. But so the the reception was kind of mixed. I mean, and people thought too that George Eliot had written it because it sounded the 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 the, the um, there was reminders of Adam Bede, you know, of George Eliot, and people thought, oh, he's you know he's it, maybe if it's not George Eliot, it's sort of a George Eliot clone. So it took a, took a while for him to emerge and to uh, to. Cl- was Hardy's name not on? Yeah, no, was it they not on thought the maybe, you know, that it was, uh, uh, I guess, not literally written by her, but it, inspired by her. Um, well, when the serial was coming out it, in the Cornhill magazine, I guess that's when it happened, because I don't think it, it was name was on the serial. Uh, it was serialized over, I think, a 12-month period, and um, people at first thought it was Elliot. Um, so when it came out as a book, yeah, it was Thomas Hardy. Um, so, uh, but then, uh, I think, uh, people appreciate it, given his later, more pessimistic work, I think readers today really relish it because it's got some great, uh, humor and, um, sort of, uh, a joyous, uh, sort of, uh, embrace of of life in a way, even though it ends up as a sort of a tragedy. The, at least the the hair, the right couple get together at the end. Unlike most of his other books, you know. So we're happy when we have a you know Gabriel marries Bathsheba. Um, Took long yeah. enough. <laughs> yeah. Um, we. I mean, I think we've done a good job of covering a lot yeah. of these questions, but. Um, I mean, I guess, I guess the question I would ask is, um, amongst Hardy scholars and and people who are, you know, deeply invested in his work. Wh- I mean, where does this fit? Where does it rank? What I mean, what what's your estimation of it in terms of his efforts? Um, well, it's really one of my favorite books. I mean, I admit that Tess of the D'Urbervilles is is a supreme achievement and. Jude the Obscure is is a brilliant book, although incredibly depressing <laughs> to read. Um, uh, Sometimes, if you're in the wrong mood, but um, it uh, you know I really like this novel and A Pair of Blue Eyes, which is the one he wrote just before it, because they're beautiful love stories, and they're beautiful evocations of landscape, and they're beautiful plots, and. Uh, so um, I really think they, I mean, it, uh, Far the Mountain Crowd is, is recognized as one of his major works, but um, sometimes there's a tendency to think of Hardy really as beginning with, um, uh, you know, the, the return of the native from the late 1870s. Return of the native, mayor of Casterbridge, Tess and then Jude the Obscure. These are these are kind of the big four. Um, but if you really want to know Hardy, you got to read it all, you know, and um, including his poetry because he's one of the great English poets as well. And he wrote four volumes of short stories, which are you know a lot of them are, are fantastic. And um, so it, it's is he is he universally recognized as I mean, I mean he, since he did poetry and short stories and novels, is he, 
is he primarily thought of as a novelist? I mean, I know what I think of him yeah. as. I mean, well, I think, but, but I, th- I mean, but I know that my way I think about things isn't necessarily the way that the scholarly consensus works. I think he's he's really recognized as as a major novelist and a major poet. Uh, you know, his ranking is pretty high in the academic. So you would say that they're about the yeah. same with poetry yeah. and. Yeah, because he he published you know what seven or eight volumes of poetry, including um, a um, this epic poem you know the Dynas uh, about Napoleonic Europe, um, and so you know he spent as much time as a poet as he as he was a, a fiction writer you know because he was writing from what eighteen ninety five till the or the the nineteen twenties um, so. Uh, and he was a writer from uh, a fiction writer from what 1870 to 1895, so 25 years of each, pretty much. Um, Where did this inspiration come from? I mean, how do you go from being an architect to well being so such a voluminous poet and novelist? Well, he was an architect because he came from a, a, a relatively poor family, you know, lower class and. He needed a livelihood, and uh, that was a big step up to be a professional man, you know, to be a white-collar architect, not a blue-collar construction worker or builder like his father. Um, but as a young man, he read tons of fiction, and he he wrote poetry, and so uh, it was only when he knew he could make a living as a writer that he, that he hazarded the, the idea of, you know, actually calling himself a writer. Because uh, that was a big step up, uh, you know, from his class origins, and that's a huge theme in his book, uh, you know, the class system in England, because so many of his stories <clears throat> represent young men, you know, struggling to improve themselves, or young women like Tess, you know, having to um, face the world coming from uh, this, uh, you know, marginal lower class family, and being victimized by Alec D'Urbeville, who's this, um, uh, you know, pseudo-aristocrat. Well, I, w- I would have to say that I've, I, I, I've really enjoyed this conversation and you bringing a lot of uh, information to the table. Like I said earlier in the conversation, there's a lot of research I have to go back and do. Um, I'm leading a little Bible study tonight but is there anything you would like to say, like in closing? Uh, uh, and, and I'm up for doing more Thomas yeah. Hardy as well. If you feel, if yeah. you feel like this naturally leads, yeah. Well, I've taught. If we should look at Jude the Obscure I've taught, or something like uh, that. About three of his other books, but uh, Tess would be my favorite to do, and for another oh, okay. one. Um, okay, fantastic. Yeah, but uh, you know, I I just Hardy is so great because he's a beautiful storyteller he's also a master stylist uh, which shows up in his poetry so he has a, an amazing command of the english language he is amazing as a, as a self-taught genius you know he he really had a minimal education never went to university uh you know he read in latin and greek and french <clears throat> through really self-education and um so he's a really profound thinker even though you know most of his stories are 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 about romantic love and relationships um but you know his vision of the world is one that i think we can all still um admire because it was kind of a fearless embrace of a sort of uh a, you know a darwinian world which um was was uh, you know, what a lot of intellectuals in Britain were, were facing in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s, you know, having to deal with this new sort of potentially post-Christian world that they, that they lived in. I, I, could you, um, I, I don't know if you'd be interested in, 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 in plugging your, your, my book, uh, intro, to, my intro, uh, your, yeah. Your intro well, to some of the your, themes once more. We've talked about are in my introduction and and in the Barnes and Noble edition. It's got a nice green cover, and you can uh, easily find it online. Um, they haven't done a, a different edition since I did this um, in two thousand five. So 
Uh, I think it's only you, I think it's only there, eight or nine dollars too, so a bargain at that. <laughs> you, there was like a there was an interesting story about how you got to do the yeah. uh, introduction for this. Do you want to share that? Uh, well, uh, one of my professors at Columbia, where I was a graduate student, uh, is the general editor for the Barnes and Noble Classics series, which was you know reissuing lots of English classics, English and American classics starting in about 2003 or so. So I just happened to uh, uh, hear about the fact that, you know, they were doing this, and I wrote a letter to um, I, this professor, George Dade, and I told him I, I love the book, and, uh, you know, I knew a fair amount about Hardy, and he said, sure, go ahead and do it. So, But they, uh, they turned these things out pretty quickly, <laughs> There was, uh, you know, a little bit of negligence in terms of some of the copy editing. So there are, you know, a few typos in the text of the book that I, I should have read through to catch myself. But, but mo you know, that's a minimal issue. But uh, uh, a lot of these uh, Barnes & Noble classics are good because they have annotations, annotations on the bottom of the page uh, for things you don't have to look up in the back as you would do in, in say, the Oxford uh, Cla World Classics or the Penguin Classics. So that's one advantage of this edition. And I think you were all, you also, I don't know, I'll let you break, break this, but you're working on a project that deals primarily with annotations right now. Do you want to let people know oh, about yeah, that okay. as well? Or do you well, want to say or fairly soon, if you're, if anyone is interested, uh, I will have uh, a bibliography on, online bibliography on uh, the Bible and American literature covering uh, the influence of the Bible in, generally on Amer a lot of American writers, which is in a series called Oxford uh, Online Bibliographies. Uh, so if anyone is interested in ser serious research, that would be a tool to turn to i am very very yeah. interested in that i that <laughs> is that is really all up in my wheelhouse yeah. so uh i I'm, I'm super excited about that well i i i've appreciated our time together dr cook i'm, I'm sorry i have i have to yes i have to, we run. Have to run yes so, so hope but hopefully we did we get to yes. cover everything you wanted I to think, talk about i think we did fantastic all right. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I will edit this and upload it to the noetic.online website and to SoundCloud and to YouTube. And I very much hope you've enjoyed this installment of our discussion of Thomas Hardy's Far From the Madden Crowd. Thank you, Dr. Cook. You're welcome.